Well, greetings and a most heartfelt salutation, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, this Sunday edition here on Collider Video. My name is John Campia. I'm the producer over here at uh, Collider Video. And this is our mailbag show, a much more laid back, relaxed kind of show where all we do is take the mailbag questions you guys send in to us. And how do you send us mailbag questions? Real simple. You simply get on your email account and you send us an email to collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, we pick out questions every day, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk to take uh, from you as well. But also, we take a whole bunch here on the weekends, and that's what we're going to do right now. But here to help me with that, first of all, is our host today, Ms. Natasha Martinez. Natasha, Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for being back. Oh, I love and you. And of course, because he was once again floating around the office, of course, Christian Harloff. I'm never going to leave. I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> I'm going to like knock on And I've, I've marks in my trunk. I can see him over there. <laughs> All right. So let's get rolling with the first question of the day. Okay. Frank does Hank, right? Frank does Hank. <laughs> Why doesn't the First Order try and clone Darth Vader since they can clone stormtroopers? Ah, an excellent question. Uh, and it's, it's not a simple answer, but it's kind of direct. Cloning is not a simple process. You had an entire race of beings living on Camino. We're getting into some sweaty territory here, but <laughs> on the on the race of cloners on Camino, they just dedicated their race to cloning. I mean, that's what they did. They were cloners, right? But even they, with all the time that it took and having you know generations of knowledge, it also took an incredible amount of DNA for them to do the cloning. So much DNA did they need that the subject of their clones, Jango Fett, they had to keep him living there with them. Over At that point, how long had he been living there? Like right. 10 years, yeah. right? So he had to be there because they needed an incredible amount of samples of DNA all the time to do the cloning. Now, it, it's not canon anymore, but what you learn in the expanded universe of novels and stuff like that, that cl cloning became banned. It became completely illegal to do. So no longer did you have like generation after generation of generation of cloners anymore because the whole practice was banned. On top of that, you need to get even just a starter sample. And Darth Vader's body was burned. I mean, it was burned to crisp and ashes. There was nothing left to clone from. So the technology wasn't around anymore. And even if somebody had it kind of secretly laying around, maybe but they wouldn't have what they could use to advance the, you know, to actually take Darth Vader and grow a new copy of him. So that is why they didn't do it. But let's go to somebody else with a different set of Star Wars knowledge. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that you see a way that they could clone Darth Vader? I could see a way that they could do it because even, even the smallest little samples of the Star Wars universe too, the science of it, you know, there's with the Kylo Ren's got the helmet so who knows what's inside the helmet what kind of DNA they can find from the helmet um, but what the viewer wrote he said they can clone stormtroopers. They never cloned stormtroopers. They they had the clone troopers because the stormtroopers you see in the original trilogy are just recruits. Those aren't clones. Yeah, they were Jango Fett clones. They were not. Uh, the in stormtroopers were the stormtroopers oh, in the original Star trilogy. Wars. Oh, and the original trilogy. Original trilogy they're Jango they're Fett clones. Right. Yes, the clone right, troopers right. were Jango Fett clones. So, um, and I also think that the reason why you're not going to see it is because it, it becomes a lazy device. I think that it's like it, it because you don't rely enough on your new villains that you have to clone Darth Vader. It's like, oh, I don't know. This Snoke guy is not working out. Uh, Kylo Ren's not too good. Let's just clone Vader. It's it just <laughs> it becomes lazy. And I don't think that they, they should do it. And I hope that they don't do it. I know there's been some rumors and saying, well, maybe that Ray is actually a Darth Vader clone. Please no. Please that's no. That's, that's simple. <laughs> All right. What's next? Matthias Durr writes, straight to the point, is Hateful Eight a flop? And if so, why? Well, the reason, it's not a ridiculous question to ask. The reason he's asking is The Hateful Eight has now been out, even in wide release, for a little bit now. And it was a $44 million movie to make. I think so far it's made 33. After you take in consideration marketing and theater share, you're probably looking to break even, probably somewhere around the neighborhood of $85 million. That So... Uh, maybe it won't break even, but is it a flop? No, it, it's not a flop. It's going to come close to breaking even. And a movie that loses a little bit of money, that's not a flop. I mean, you have to lose, I believe, you have to lose a significant amount of money in relation to what your budget was to consider yourself a flop. And I, you know, is it doing gangbusters business? No. Are people going out in droves to see Hateful Eight? No. But is it a flop? I think that's a big stretch. I just don't think you can call it that. What do you think? No, I don't think it's a flop, but I, th I think there was too many things working against uh, this movie. The first is that Westerns are tough to sell. And then you say, well, what about Django? Django's a little different. Django's not a traditional Western, and this isn't necessarily a traditional Western. It's Tarantino, but you still see it and you think, 
people in a house, it's it's one location. It's a harder sell. Plus, I think Star Wars did hurt it. And what I mean, I know that Tarantino had that whole thing with the one theater. That not, That's not what I mean. Star Wars hurt in the fact because when Tarantino normally puts out a movie in December, he owns December. It's usually the, right. the talk of December is Tarantino's movie. People even forgot that Tarantino's movie came out for the most part because everyone was talking about Star Wars. So um, I think that that hurt it. I think the Western part hurt it. I don't think it was a flop. I think it was probably disappointing to everybody, including Tarantino himself. Um, and I think that the other thing is that the 70 millimeter, it was tough to for a lot of people when it first came out and the theaters to hold it. And he's very... He stands strong on on how the movie needs to be run and and, and what theater and and he he goes traditional old school. I mean, he took he took the actual lens. I think for for one. Yep. For which for oh, Ben Hur. Yeah. Ben Hur. Uh, I can't. Remember. Was it Ben Hur? I think actually? it was Ben Hur. Yeah, I remember he dug up the actual lens used for one of those classic movies. It was movies Ben Hur. He took the actual, which I think lens. is really cool. Really cool. But I mean, it's it's stuff like that though that he's just he stands strong and says, you know, I'm just I'm doing things my way. And I don't think that necessarily hurt the box office so much. But I think the most what hurt it the most, I think, was Star Wars and the fact that it was a western. All right. Cole Myers writes, Hello, Movie Talk crew. In my opinion, The Revenant has the strongest case of all the contenders to win the Best Picture Oscar this year. I was wondering if the fact that Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu won Best Picture and Director last year for Birdman will have an effect on The Revenant's chances for the big awards this year, or possibly even Leo's chance at Best Actor. Are there any examples of directors winning back-to-back in previous years? Thanks. The only example I know of of a director winning Best Director back to back is John Ford in the 1940s, where he ran for Grapes of Wrath, and then he won something about the valley. I'm trying to remember how green was my valley, or green is my valley, or something like that. The following green is my valley, but it's like it's like going back to the 1940s. I think this last time it's happened. the biggest thing standing, we've talked about this on the show before, the biggest thing standing in between Leonardo DiCaprio right now and a Best Actor nomination, or a Best Actor win, because I believe he's going to get nominated. Yeah. But the biggest thing standing in his way this year is not that Alejandro was nominated for Best Director that year. The biggest thing standing in his way is a dude by the name of Michael Fassbender, uh, who put in a performance on Jobs, and a little guy named Eddie Redmayne, who happens to be the reigning defending Best uh, Actor, who did a little film called The Danish Girl this year. And you even got Paul Dano, um, who just blew a lot of people's minds with what he did in Love and Mercy. Those are the big things standing in Leonardo DiCaprio's way this year. Um, I, at best, I have Leo coming in second, and that's maybe, maybe second. He's definitely behind, I think your front runner right now is Michael Fassbender, but there's a solid argument right now that he's behind uh, Eddie Redmayne as well. And then you could make an argument that he might even be behind Paul Dano. So it is a tough field. Like every year Leo is nominated, it's a tough field. That's what's standing in his way right now. Uh, but I don't think that Alejandro being nominated and winning last year will have any effect this year. Um, and again, I I think the biggest thing standing in The Revenant's way for winning Best Picture is another movie. It's Spotlight. It ain't yeah. it ain't uh, The Revenant. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. I don't know. How would you break it down? I unfortunately do think sometimes that it, it and it shouldn't, I do think that it has an effect um, if somebody won last year, even if they have a great performance, that it... it it hurts the following year. I just, I just think it does. It's like, oh no, I'm not going to judge it on that. But ah, they won last year. I just, I, th- I think that it does have an effect. Um, I also think that Leonardo DiCaprio is going to have a tough fight this year. The guy just every time he gets nominated, he's just going up against other guys that were just that much better. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the case again this year. And everyone's going to call a foul and be like, oh, he lost again. They <laughs> yeah. hate him. They hate him. And it's like, Fastbender is just really good Eddie Redmayne really really good I actually don't think Paul Dano is going to be in there I think it's going to be um, Brian Cranston for Trumbo um, hmm. and possibly uh, Matt Damon for for The Martian and which was also the BAFTA nominations as right well. and, and you know Matt Damon was so good in The Martian yeah he was so good well hey listen guys before we go on the next question I just got notified of something because I want to make clear um, you know a lot of you guys have been wondering uh, where Sinead because uh, Sinead has been around for a while and uh, we <laughs> this is no joke because some of you are going to think I'm joking, and it's really no joke, but she just made this public, so now we know we can we can let you guys know. We want to congratulate uh, Sinead, uh, who just gave birth to <laughs> her first son, um, who, breaking all of our hearts around here, she did not name Pepita. 
Uh, <laughs> we were kind of holding out for Peter. No, she actually named her son Harrison after Harrison Ford. That's awesome. Which is the coolest thing in the world. She <laughs> told us beforehand she was going to yeah. do that. That's so and cool. I got to admit, I kind of wondered, is she actually going to follow through on that? And she followed through on it. So yeah, Sinead is actually now a first time mom and we are so happy for her and so excited for her. So we just want to collectively say to Sinead, congratulations, we love you. And, uh, and welcome to our family, our little movie talk family, Harrison. It's Little awesome. Harrison. Little oh. Harrison. So cute. All right, you better not next? take my job, I'll tell you that. I know. <laughs> okay, Jessica Biden writes, me and my boyfriend have been watching you guys since the Man of Steel review way back when. I have a basic understanding of why you guys left AMC, but what made you decide to join us with Collider? Were you looking at other options at the same time? If so, what gave Collider the edge? Well, let me answer this, honestly. Go for it. Yeah, by all <laughs> means. Totally I'd love kidding. your input on that. Totally um, yeah, like when uh, when we uh, when we split with AMC and AMC is still a great sponsor of ours here, and we have a great relationship with AMC. We love what we do what we do with AMC. Um, I I had taken as as a lot of the people who know me know I took a couple of meetings and I had a few offers of what I was going to do next. And actually, one of the things I'm going to tell you this: the thing I was leaning towards um, was I had I was going to do my own thing again because uh, I had an offer from somebody to bankroll me doing my own thing just from my own home studio uh, and they were going to re re retain the rights to sell advertising on, on it and all that kind of stuff. And I was actually really excited about just doing my own thing again. I was really stoked about it. And then I talked to complex and complex is the company that owns collider. And they, I tell you guys, the, and this is the, if you're the, Hey, is this the same complex? Uh, yeah, this is the same complex. Uh, that was complex magazine and then complex media and now just complex. Uh, you, they have a wonderful YouTube channel of their own, which you should check out. Absolutely. Um, and they came around and I started talking to a couple of the execs there and I just loved their vision. Um, and they really had a vision, not just for what we could do in the future, but they had a real love for what we were doing already. And I, what really appealed to me personally was we were able to keep the band together. And that became really exciting to me that we could do that with this company and with Collider and, and all that kind of stuff that I thought we had just a great chance to, to keep what we're doing and then build on the momentum we had and keep going, continue to work with amazing people like Christian Harloff and Dennis Zen and, and, and all the people here at Collider, you know, Schnepp and Wendy and, and Mark and uh, yeah, everybody, you know, Jonathan, Ray, uh, Ashley, you know, we wanted, I wanted to do that. And so at the end of the day, um, I wanted to do that. And then I asked everybody else I said, Hey guys, if I do this, would you guys want to come? And the team said, yeah, we love working together as a team, everybody here. And that's how we ended up here. You, you were from a different perspective than me. Do you have anything you want to add? To no, that? we didn't know what the hell was going on at first. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were all trying to figure out what was going on. And then once, um, you know, once it all came through and we, as a team, like you said, we, we all trusted in your vision and said, yeah, let's do it. And, and couldn't be happier. Do you have a perspective on this? Oh, you weren't I, even here. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to be a part of the Collider crew. I love it here. And yeah, can't wait and to And we love continue. having you. All oh, right. What's you. next? All right. Marcel Pelé writes, hi, guys. Massive fan. Always watch the show regularly. I just wanted to know, we have seen Deadpool reference X-Men in the trailer, which opens the door for a possible collaboration in the future. But my question is, would the R rating of Deadpool affect the character if we saw him appear in an X-Men movie? This is always like going back to when we were even discussing before they announced that Deadpool would be rated R. We, and we would often talk about the pros and the cons of being R and then the pros and the cons of being uh, not rated R. And one of the things that worked against being R was the fact that that makes it a little tricky if you want to long-term, and you know Fox wants to long-term make this a cinematic universe, you know that that's, that's right. what they want to do. It makes it a little bit tricky because how do you bring Deadpool into an X-Men film, which is PG? 13. Well, yeah, right. but, but is anything PG, is anything straight rated straight PG anymore? Yeah. Everything's but I mean, in like either G or PG-13 now, but at right, any rate. Right. So, you know, you get these X-Men, which are PG-13, and you're going to have Deadpool, which is rated R, and... You know, if you bring Deadpool to cameo or have not ju not just cameo, but be in an X Men film, is that going to be jarring to the audience? Because we're going to get used to hearing him talk a certain way when we see the Deadpool R rated film, and now he's going to have to talk a different way. Is that going to be jarring? That is a challenge. And honestly, I don't know how they handle it right now. I'm sure they've got a plan. I'm just as a fan, I'm fascinated to see what that plan is. For now, 
I'm just super stoked to see Deadpool. I mean, I can't believe how excited I am to see Deadpool. Yeah. I mean, I've always been like, yeah, they're making a Deadpool movie. But man, this ad campaign has just like put me over the edge. Like it, for me personally, it's gone from, hey, I'm really glad they're making that Deadpool movie to it's in my top five most anticipated films wow. of the year now. Like I, I, there are m movies I have been so stoked for for so long that are coming out this year that I'm not anticipating as much as Deadpool now, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, how do you think they're going to handle this whole R character in a non R universe sort of thing? I think they don't care. I think that it's a matter of, at this point, they're going to say, let's just see how Deadpool does first. Let's see how this rated R super, that's their first priority is let's see how this rated R character, superhero character does first. If it does really well, they'll figure it out because if the fans respond to a rated R version, they go to the rated R version and then we get to still see him in an X-Men movie, but he's got to, bless you, got to tone himself <laughs> down a little bit. Um, you know, then who cares? Let him tone himself down for a, for a second or two because we know we're going to get him being foul mouth in the sequel. If the first, if Deadpool, the rated R version is amazing and we love everything about it and he is just balls to the wall, there's everything you, you see, the, the cursing, the blood, everything you want from the Deadpool comics is in the movie and we're satisfied. And then they say, oh, we're going to put him in an next X-Men movie, but he's got to be toned down a little bit. You go, I don't care because I get to see him in an X-Men movie and then I get to see him curse and do bloody stuff again in the sequel. So we'll be fine. <laughs> you know what? Here's an interesting thing. I remember when they still hadn't announced, we hadn't figured out whether they're doing RPG 13 for Deadpool. You know, I can't remember if it was you or Schnapp or somebody came up saying, hey, hey, what if they just did the movie and because it's like a fourth wall breaking kind of movie, what if they beeped him? What if you had a movie Schnapp, with Schnapp said it, Kurth yeah. Was it Schnapp yeah. that came up? What if you beeped him in that? It's like, okay, but you know what? You could do that in an X-Men film if you had Deadpool in that it and you so literally funny. beeped him when Deadpool would curse. You could. could the only funny. problem I thought about that, the only problem is that I don't know works as well in an X-Men movie because... The, if you because Schnepp's, Schnepp's original vision of that I think was was doing it in the Deadpool movie, which yeah. the comedy fits it. The comedy's not so is not flying like it is in Deadpool in X Men movies. So it'd be harder to do. It'd be interesting to do, but it would be interesting if he walks in and you know if he's working with the X Men and and he's about to shoot off at the mouth and Professor X is like. Ah. It's, and he keeps and he keeps them like under wraps for a little bit. And he's just like, all right. And then Dad's watching. You know. Then he goes off. And he's like, I have to do. And it, but the thing about Deadpool is he does that Ferris Bueller thing, so he can turn to the camera or whatever it is too, and he can just like, we'll have to wait until my movie to do this. Whatever he says, you know, because <laughs> Deadpool can do that. Because Deadpool can do that. So you know, you can do so much with him because of the comedy. And I don't think we're gonna really be mad if he's not throwing the f bomb in an X Men movie. As long as he still acts like Deadpool, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. All right, what's next? Romolo Malone writes, my question is that do you guys think we will ever see Liv Tyler as Betty Ross again in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but this time on screen with Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk? You know, I actually quite enjoyed Liv Tyler as Betty Ross playing opposite of, uh, uh, I always, uh, Ed Norton, Ed Norton yeah. uh, playing opposite Ed Norton in that Ed Hor Norton Hulk film. And the reason that this is a valid question is because some people still forget that that Ed Norton Hulk film is continuity with the Mark Ruffalo, that is tech, that is the same character. Well, her dad, William Hurt, is coming yeah, back. William Hurt, yeah. General Thunderbolt Ross is coming yep. back in. So that is they just switched actors. That is the same continuity. So that's canon. That movie is canon, um, the one with Liv Tyler. And so a lot of people, when Mark Ruffalo showed up, a lot of people were asking, "Hey, where's Betty Ross?" I don't think we're going to see her again. Number one, I don't think Liv Tyler herself has a lot of interest in coming back to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But even if she did. A uh, little bit of a spoiler alert, but the movie's been out forever. Uh, in Avengers Age of Ultron, they've introduced a new love interest for Mark Ruffalo. And it looks like a more significant love interest for Banner moving forward. I think they're gonna, there's going to be repercussions on this. So because of that, now you saw Thunderbolt Ross is coming back. So that opens the door. Well, maybe Betty Ross comes back too. But I think they're pretty stuck on this. They're going to be developing a Hulk and Black Widow uh, romance. What do you think? I don't know. She seems to have a new love interest every movie. Like she likes Cap one movie. She likes Tony Stark one Man, other there movie. There's nothing that suggested that was ever more than platonic. And Cap, Cap and, this, and yeah. well, it seemed like they were kind of. He even he even makes mention to it in Ultron that it was like you know he when he's talking to um, Ruffalo at the bar in Ultron. It's like seems like he had some kind of feelings there for her, but I don't know but the, what I mean is that they if if they wanted to they could go away from it if mm -hmm. they wanted to I mean they're probably going to play off of it but I like to see Liv Tyler come back I thought she was great as Betty Ross and I actually really I really enjoyed Edward Norton as the Hulk so did I yeah. love Ruffalo but I thought Ed Norton was great it's just unfortunately you know he had problems behind the scenes with those guys and they didn't get along and, and it got replaced it happens but um 
it's interesting that they're bringing Hurt back, and maybe they do bring. And who's to say that she's got to still be a love interest if she comes back? You know, it, she just be a scientist. She could just come yeah. and be a scientist. People do move on. And, <laughs> people move on. It's true. So, like, you it, say that as if you're speaking from experience, <laughs> Natasha. We got to talk about this. Well, <laughs> well so they. It would be interesting if she even maybe lent some kind of expertise on him because they're looking for him still. Maybe she helps look for him. Who knows? Yeah, because. One way or the other, even though it was really him that found her, she found him once before, so yep. maybe it can happen again. Yep. All right, what's next? Yankee Doodle Dandy writes, <laughs> Hi, guys. Any chance you guys will do a Star Trek cancel in the future like you are doing with Jedi cancel? Thanks. It's an interesting question, but no chance in hell. Um, <laughs> you're right. You got Christian Spinelli's <laughs> coffee. Um, yeah, and look, if you've watched this show for any period of time, you know I love my Star Trek stuff. I, I, I do. I love the Star Trek stuff. I even love what J.J. <laughs> Abrams has done. I get into some debates with our own Robert Meyer Burnett on Heroes, who is a real classic Star Wars junkie, and he hates the fact that I love the J.J. Abrams. But I do. I love the classic ones. I loved Picard. I loved the new stuff. Uh, that last. That last series they did, uh, Enterprise, was was not so great, although it had some decent episodes. But I watched almost all the other TV shows, a big fan of it. But uh, there are two main reasons why you'll never see us do like a Star Trek Council like we do a Jedi Council. Uh, well, three. The least important one is none of us here are as psychotic about Star Trek as a lot of us are about Star Wars. Reason number two is Star Wars is a property that has a new movie coming every single year and has a very active canon world as well with new novels and comics and everything to supplement one new movie every single year. We've got the episodes, we've got the anthologies, we've got there's a lot of different stuff to do there. But number three, and this is probably the most important one, is that there simply aren't as many hardcore Star Trek fans as there are Star Wars fans. And that's... That, that doesn't matter. That, that's fine. It's just that when you're putting together a show, you have to take in consideration what is our potential audience. There's a lot more potential audience with us doing a Star Wars specific show than there would be to do a Star Trek show. Now, none of that is meant as any disrespect to anybody who is a Star Trek fan. I myself am a Star Trek fan. But the realities are, you know, I'm also a massive, massive fan of Megaforce, that 1980s action film that almost none of you have seen, but I freaking love it. Uh, it's fantastic. It was it was G.I. Joe the movie, really, before there was a G.I. Joe movie. It's called Megaforce. Check it out. Um, but I love that movie. But there's not an ongoing continuing universe for it. There's not a big fan, a big enough fan base for it, and so we don't do a show about Megaforce, and that's kind of the the same reason. So there's no way we're going to be doing a Star Trek Council type of show, but not because I have any lack of respect or love for Star Trek. I do. It's just that it doesn't meet those other criteria. How would you address that, guys? I'm Scott fucking Manson. I can do one. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Manson would be able to do it. Scott Manson would go yeah. crazy for I that. I mean, 1973. Um, but they they actually. Uh, we pro- love Scott Mance, I love by the Scott way. Mance is one of my Scott best Mance. friends in this business. Uh, but I think that Scott Mance is a guy, though, the reason I bring him up. He is a guy that can speak passionately about Star Trek all the time, can tell you all the dates, can tell you all the movies. Um, Maybe we should get him and Robert Meyer Burnett to do one together. Maybe, Maybe but, they could do but one. But the thing is that what I fear, even those two guys will struggle to do, is find stuff that's coming out all the time. Relevant new information. The last Star Trek movie was like two or three years ago. Okay, Star Wars has a new movie coming out every year every year so there's stuff like even though the force awakens has people had asked people had asked me you know, i tweeted out now that force awakens is gone are you going to stop doing jedi council no we got the, another movie coming out in 11 months rogue one is is heating up now with teasers and all and and then you have the, the new comics that john alluded to and the, and the novels and this 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 canon that continues all the universe star trek doesn't have that it certainly has its fan base it it absolutely and has a lot of fan fiction absolutely but does canon it's not it's not the same thing um so I'm curious to see what happened because, and also, it's lost. It lost its director. The last trailer hasn't really played too well. Um, but it's not to say there's not an audience out there. I just think that the crew that we're dealing with right here, uh, I don't necessarily know if we could do a Star Trek show every week. Agreed. All right. What's next? Michael Gasparini writes, "Great job with all of your work. My question is, do you think we will ever see an animated film win Best Picture? Inside Out is arguably one of the best ten films of the year, and it will be lucky 
to get a nomination. Mm. There have been years past where an animated film could have won the best picture up Toy Story 3. Wally wasn't even nominated and it was possibly the best film of 2008. Will the Academy ever embrace an animated film? Well, the Academy has started embracing animated film. Like three movies in particular have been nominated. Three animated films have been nominated for best picture. Beauty and the Beast was the very first animated film ever to be nominated for best picture at the Oscars. Uh, Up was nominated for best picture and Toy Story 3 were nominated for best picture. Now, uh, and I agree with you, Wally, damn right. Okay, Wally should have been nominated for Best Picture of the Year it was out. I'm not saying it should have won, but it should have been nominated. Ratatouille <gasps> is a movie that to me, should, oh, I love that movie, <laughs> should have been nominated for Best Picture. It was the number one critically rated film that year was Ratatouille, didn't get nominated for the Oscars. But you do see the, uh, and then the Oscars, <sighs> They tried to address the situation. What they actually did was they created a cop-out and they created the best animated feature category, which I believe is just a cop-out and a way for them to not have to deal with the issue of animation. But to the Academy's credit, they have been nominating in recent years up Toy Story 3. They have been nominating films for Best Picture. Anyway, so they have been giving love, a little bit of love, but love nonetheless to the animated genre. I agree with you in the sense that for me, Inside Out is in my top five best pictures of 2015. I Adore that movie. I think it is beyond intelligent. It is a super smart movie. It follows in the Pixar tradition of not being a kid movie. It is a kid-friendly movie that deals with a lot of adult themes, much like The Incredibles did, much like Up does. But there's things in there that kids can gravitate to, but it's the parents who are actually appreciating it far more. And I found Inside Out to be an incredibly smart, incredibly emotional, very touching movie, well-directed, well-crafted, the whole bit. For me, it's in the top five. And two months ago, I would have almost guaranteed it would get a nomination this year. But I agree with you now. I don't think that's the case. I think maybe if the Oscars nominate 10 films this year, and there's no guarantee they will, they can nominate anywhere between five and 10. If they nominate 10, then I think there's a chance that Inside Out gets one of those nominee spots. But I have felt its momentum die about two months ago and people just stopped talking about it. And for the life of me, I don't know why, because I think Inside Out is brilliant. It's not my best picture of the year, but it's certainly in my top five and I would nominate it. Anyway, Christian, what about you? Um, I think that animation, the same way with comedy, should be nominated a lot more than they are. But I don't think animation's ever going to win. I just don't because of the reason that you said with the, the they have the animation category. And I think when one does get nominated, the Academy's like, all right, well, we nominated one. I don't think they're going to not they're ever going to uh, choose one over a live action film. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. I hope I'm wrong if the movie deserves to win. Um, I do love Inside Out. But if you and it and I think it do, should get a nomination, it won't. But I think that it should. I don't think that it's better than some of the other movies that it will go. Like, I, if it was me and I was an Academy voter and it was Spotlight against Inside Out, I'm picking Spotlight. Oh, me too. Yeah, I don't think it's it's a, the clear winner this year. Right. I'm just saying it's in my top five. That's why I also think it's going to have kind of an uphill battle all the way around to actually win. But there's probably an animation or animation style. You know, I, I should hold back on saying never because I don't know what animation is going to be like in 10, 15 years True. from now, too. Yeah. So um, at least in the, not, in the next five, 10 years, I don't see it happening. If you could have picked one animated film, Natasha, that one animated film that you love, that you think, hey, maybe this animated film deserved a best picture Oscar on its mantle, which animated film would you pick out of the ones that you've seen and loved? Mm. I'm putting you on the spot. I know. Oh, gosh. I mean, of course, Pixar their movies are the best. I love Finding Nemo. That's one of my favorites. I'm surprised by how many people I say I hear say Finding Nemo. I love Nemo. Finding Nemo. And what's crazy is I saw The Good Dinosaur um, recently, not like right when it was released, but I saw The Good Dinosaur and I was like, all right, that was a good film. Like I'd heard mixed reviews about it. And then I actually babysat one of my friend's kids and we watched Finding Nemo. And I'm just sitting there. That's I probably should have been seen watching. This year? Uh, this year I rewatched it. Oh, no, you rewatched I, I've it. watched okay, it okay. before. Um, but I was watching it and not watching the kids. Sorry, Tammy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the movie is so good. The character development in it, it's just, it's amazing. And the visuals. So um, I think I probably would nominate that film. And I'm excited to see what they do with Finding Dory. I don't know. It's just this whole extra world. You know, it's weird because I, it is surprising to me how many people, when you talk about Pixar, will say that Finding Dory. Uh, I keep want, now I just want to say Finding, Finding Dory, Dory. <laughs> but Finding Nemo is their favorite. It might be my favorite. It's not even in my top five. Really? I, I, I really? enjoy it very, very much, but that's just a testament 
to how good because like for me, I, like I'm not putting these in any order, but like you're talking about Up, Toy Story three, Toy yeah. Story two, The Incredibles, Wall-E. Uh, I mean, on and on and on, and that's five right there. Right. Ratatouille, the one that we already mentioned as well. I mean, it's Incredibles. Well, there's just so oh, many good right. ones. Like all those titles that you just named, like my heart's like, oh yeah. yes, ah, uh, uh. yeah. And I came out of the Good Dinosaur this year. I'm like, I really like Good Dinosaur. Not in my top ten Pixar films right. of all time. Yeah, I put I put Toy really Story like three it. and Finding Nemo right here. The, those mm. those are my probably two favorites. Well, all right, folks, so jump in the comment section. What are your favorite Pixar films? Let us know. Well, that'll do it for us guys for uh, this weekend for Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, listen, while you're here, take a second and make sure you click on the subscribe button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on all the great videos we got going on over here. Movie Talk Monday through Friday. Of course, our Mailbags, Jedi Council, Heroes, lots of other stuff. We got our recap shows are launching back up in the next week or two. Keep your eyes open for that. So make sure you subscribe to our Collider Video YouTube channel and click thumbs up on this video and share it on your Facebook and on your Twitter accounts. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. Of course, Natasha Martinez, thank you so much for hosting this weekend. Where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And if you ever hire to babysit, make sure there's no home entertainment yes. system. Yeah, right. <laughs> and of course, sitting on the end there, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? You can find me hosting Star Trek Council. <laughs> um, you can find me uh, every Thursday uh Star Wars Jedi Council, Collider Jedi Council. Make sure you hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Get your questions out there so we can pick some. And you guys have been sending out some great ones, by the way, recently. And um, follow me at Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter just by following me at John Campia. Make sure you follow me there, guys, because I do a lot of the announcements and stuff like that about what's going on with uh, Collider Video and stuff like that on there first. So you're going to be wanting to be following me there. And of course, Keep your eyes open. My first novel, The Pride, comes out very soon. I will keep you up to date on when and where you can get that shortly. Also, I want to thank uh, everybody behind the scenes, Jonathan and Dennis, and thank you to you guys for joining us. So, for Collider Video, my name is John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>